This is a, a very exciting panel because there are, first of all, because we, we've got you two guys here, um, but it's also, you, you are, I, I think when you think about disruption in the financial services industry, um, you are in some ways feeling it before a lot of other banks, uh, other financial service firms might be. One of the, some of the things we want to cover at this panel are technology, millennials, and dealing with, um, dealing with, with disruption in both your businesses and the economy. And I think all of these are tied together as we'll discuss. Why don't we start first with this idea of how you look at the disruption in financial services. You look at something like the rise of the robo, um, uh, uh, robo advisors. Um, how you think about a lot of different firms who aren't regulated and can make fast moves deciding that they want to be in your business and how you respond to it. So first, can you tell me both how you think about being disrupted, where the disruption happens, how you monitor what's going on in, in your world? Sure. So why don't I begin? And thank you for having us, Dan. We really appreciate being here. And um, you know, we think about it in a variety of different ways. And technology for us is both a business enabler as well as a potential disruptor. Uh, much of what the Bank of New York Mellon does is technology driven. We provide platforms for advisors to service the wealth management clients of Merrill Lynch and others. We provide platforms for institutional investors, platforms for lots of different people. So. Technology is what we do and how we do it. We're building applications ourselves in order to try to help the investor get better returns or help the investor drive down their costs for what the investor is looking for and get better returns that way as well. So we do it from both the management side as well as the servicing side of assets. We're always looking at developing new technologies or applications that our clients are looking for, but also intersecting with the fintech world in terms of what's new being developed out there that we should partner with, plug into our platforms, compete with, mm -hmm. or be afraid of. And there's lots of them out there. And you know, a, there's a lot of discussion in the payment space in particular. Um, and that's probably the space that's been most active where people like PayPal and others uh, have got a really, and Apple Pay now, have really got a, a, a stronghold. And so we have a big payments business. And so we're looking at, is that something that we should be afraid of or we can partner with? So that's just you know, a multitude of different ways we're looking at it. And I think as it, it relates to us, I mean, it's squarely around the deliver of investment results and the process. That's where a lot of the media attention is. And it's, and it's fair. So how do we, we, we pay very close attention to it? It's obviously something that we think about. But I also like it, why? Why is this happening? Mm -hmm. And to me, when there's an absence of value or absence of perceived value, that's where the disruption can yeah. take place. So like Gerald said, we, we are, uh, technology is absolutely critical to what we do and how we do it. We want to look at it from how the client wants to interact with us. What is technology as an enabler? And you did such a great job of talking about the business realities. We have the same you know, issues and opportunities. But I look at it as, uh, well, how do we use it to enhance the client relationship? And so whether it is you take um, what the concept of robo-advising is one of the I think the, the key elements of that is automatic rebalancing of a portfolio at some, for some point in time. Well, Dalbar will tell you in studies that when individual investors work on their own, one of the biggest challenges is what they call behavioral drag. Uh, our, in, our inability to buy and sell at the right time, you put a discipline in place, you take that behavior out, you, know, you should get a better result. So it's an example of where we want to embrace those concepts. We want to embrace how technology can enable the relationship, can enhance returns, can enhance the experience for the client, uh, and, and learn from it, incorporate it. So we, we, I, we really see it as an opportunity to get better. But if you think about it as something that is, you're, you're dealing with this idea of auto rebalancing, but if you look at the studies from millennials, if you look at how consumer tech has infected, has, has, is driving enterprise tech, that people want to be able to, they don't want to talk to people. They want to yeah. just Google and get the answers or just put the money away without ever dealing with someone. They want an interface that looks like a consumer app rather than yeah. being some kind of oracle-y, you know, million different uh, menus you have to go through. So you guys are both playing in a space where it's not just, um, it's not just doing one kind of service differently. It's, it's changing the whole way that, that, that you deal with the customer, right? 
Uh, I, I would agree completely. And that one of the things we talk about internally is uh, as we build technology and apps, is it's going to have the look and feel that you and I experience on your tablet, on your smartphone, whatever else, to be able to get the information as quickly, don't have to type in an account number, don't have to know what you're exactly what you're looking for, and essentially put search engines on top of the data that we do provide. Mm -hmm and make that experience really powerful to the person. So I and I agree with you. I talk to my kids only by text. Um, that everything is, can be, doesn't have to be done through a phone call, through a person-to-person -person meeting. That people can research and get as much information as they want. And then if they want to call someone for advice, we have that channel as well. I, I, I'm going to challenge a little bit of the notion that I have three millennials um, as children. Good news is they, they text me, but they talk to me too, which I'm very proud of. Congratulations. I, <laughs> thank you. I must be doing something right. I, I've, I've got to find your formula. <laughs> so the, the work we're doing with our millennial clients, the kids of our clients, and our employees suggests that they want to use technology as an enhancer and convenience, but they still want to have an interaction with a human being around their money and the questions they have about it. It's when they can't get the questions answered the way they want through technology is when they want to have a relationship with a person. So I think we have to be careful not to project uh, so a trend on a group of people who are at a per certain stage in their life where they're busy and, they're, and they're, they're much more comfortable with looking for answers like that as a substitute for uh, a, a relationship with another person. Got it. Do you now? With all of this, as, as these trends happen, it really, it, I would assume it changes how you hire also. Not just how you hire in terms of the people who are, who are the advisors, but also who are building your products. You're, you're now, as you talk about, you're a technology company. Yep. It means you're up against the Facebooks and other places that, that Googles that can go and hire from major campuses. How are you luring both these technologists? How are you luring millennials to your company? Is it important? How do you think about that? Well, it's, it's critically important because we want the best and the brightest talent in the world like everyone else does. Um, we're not going to be able to move the needle on the technology space and we get, unless we get those kind of individuals in our firm. So we do the normal campus recruiting process. We use LinkedIn a lot um, as, a, as a great source of recruiting and getting our brand and name and, and uh, projection of our firm out in, you know, to the masses around the world. Um, you know, so that's we're, we're looking through a variety of different channels to to reach the potential hires of our company. And one of the things that's challenging for a financial institution, which I think is where you're going with your question, wow. we have to be able to project to the future employee how they're going to do something where the outcome is good for society, you know, good for um, others other than the profit making of our firm. Right. And we have lots of really cool things that we're, we're doing and lots of really cool things we're solving for the financial industry. And getting that connection, that emotional connection to the cool things that we're doing or the important things that we're doing for society or financial markets is how we're trying to connect with those individuals. Is it enough? When you go to campuses, is that enough to be able to talk about what well, you're we're, doing? Well, we're not a widely known firm. We're not Merrill Lynch, who's got a brand across oh, the universe. You know, most people don't know what we do. Um, and so making sure our brand and what we do gets out more broadly is an important element of how we're trying to connect with those individuals. We actually have innovation labs that we've set up. Um, we have one here in New York. We have one in um, Silicon Valley that we set up. We have one in Pittsburgh. We invite people to visit the labs, see some of the things, go on our websites, see some of the projects we're working on. And in some ways, we're putting some of the applications we're developing, we're developing in a structured environment so APIs can be used to enhance that. So now some of our applications are up on our private cloud. We have our own developers who are fixing it, working on them. But third-party developers who sit with our clients can see these things. So there's multiple ways that we're getting our information and our brand in the marketplace so technologists and engineers can say, hey, that's something that I'd really like to get involved with. I think one of the key things, and, and I have specific examples of, of the how question, but is this notion, to me, the table stake that we've clearly heard from, um, from our millennial advisors, our millennial employees and clients is if your values don't align with mine, I'm out of here. And it's more than that, that the strategy that you have to grow your business has to incorporate those values that align with mine for me to really want to stay here. And I think that's, that's a lesson that we really have to pay attention yeah. to. 
there's th sort of three things. We just did a study um, on attracting millennials into the, into the wealth management business, and there's sort of three categories. There's the, those that get it. We have a, our traditional training program for advisors. There's those that are interested but don't really understand. We've created a whole new role in our development program that's a team-based role where they're, um, how they're evaluated is based on the success of the whole team, not just their own success. And that's attracting um, not only those kinds of people, but also has a real big impact from a diversity standpoint, because some people don't have the mindset um, of a commission salesman yeah. or woman. And then the third thing is those who don't get it but want to understand it, that would be coming to our learning organization and other parts of the organization where they can become part of what we do as a business, but not be at the you know, client-facing roles. Got it. And this team, the, the, the team-based one and the innovation lab are both really interesting that they would not be there are pretty big departures for both your businesses, right? Is that something that you would have, did you have either of those set up before the financial crisis? Is this something that is relatively new within the last couple of years? And the second part of that question is, are these things that you do just as a way of attracting certain types of people, or are they now a core part of the business going forward? So um, our innovation labs are post the financial crisis. Um, so let's start with that. Some of our social networking and use of social media internally is by and large post the financial crisis. And we're learning as we're going in terms of how to engage with our employees, engage with third parties uh, more effectively. Um, we are finding that we want it to be part of the core. This is not you know, an experiment. One of the reasons why we set up these innovation labs was not only to attract the best and the brightest and to work on some of the applications that are important to us, but it's also to change the way we're doing business. The way we change, the changing the way we actually develop applications. In a traditional bank, you have your technology sector, somebody gives them a problem from the business side or a client asks for something, you throw it over the transom, the technologists go off and build something, they take two, three years to do it, they send it back and you go, that's not what I asked for. Um, in the new order of, of things, um, in our innovation labs, we tell them what the problem is, we connect them to the business, we give them six months and we go away. Mm -hmm. Solve the problem within six months or less, iterate with the business, you know, ideate with the client, really collaborate as a team, and do it very differently than we've traditionally built applications in the past. And you expect That's the rest a fundamental of the company, change to our company. And the rest of the company watches this. I assume you bring visibility to all of these things and people learn. You're hoping people learn from it, and our traditional application developers and engineers are going, hmm, this is pretty interesting. Right. And then we allow people to collaborate on our own social networks as teams. Now, sometimes they're teams for hobbies, mm -hmm. but more often they're teams to solve problems. And they're teams of people from across the pump company that they can use our internal social network to collaborate on and trade ideas. And we encourage that. John, what is, for you, nice to have, need to have this team? No, it's need to have. I mean, it's something we should have, I mean, we were starting to realize this at the, at the, you know, at the beginning of 2000 and the like, and you got a culture that you have to change over time. Um, but it was growing more and more clear to us that both us and our clients realized that the complexity of what we can offer clients and the range of those services, and in our case, especially after the crisis, we came together with Bank of America and had a whole new set of capabilities, that one person was, it was impossible for one person to deliver and know everything they needed to know. And the clients got to a point where they were tired of waiting and they wanted to have a answer quickly like they can get on their phone. And so the necessity for teams really was client driven, but it was also the reality of actually trying to deliver what we can for clients efficiently and effectively. That's great. One theme of both of, of what you've both been talking about is speed, is the increased speed mm -hmm. of the world. Um, you're in heavily regulated industries. You're competing with people who are also probably going to be regulated at some point, but don't mind breaking the rules along the way. <laughs> How do you think about the, the idea of being able to move fast, but also deal with Washington with whatever you do? How much of your brain is focused on, oh, we're gonna, we can't do this versus we have to do it and we'll deal with it later? Well, I'm gonna put regulation aside because I'll depress the entire audience. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, regulation is something that we have to deal with. It's just a fact of life. But we don't want to discourage the company from thinking of new ideas, new products, new services, new capabilities, and finding ways to bring those ideas to market much, much faster. And that's, again, where technology is our friend. And that's where technology can be the enabler, where we can partner with different people who develop applications, put them and integrate them into our platforms, offer something better to our clients, 
And then, as I said earlier, put them in a structured form where APIs can be developed by our own engineers as well as third parties. You get much, much faster output. And our own employees feel, see the results much faster, mm -hmm. too. And so we talk about speed and the urgency in everything we do. And speed to market is critical. I mean, the, the only thing I'd add is that if we are out in front doing everything we should be doing for our clients and our customers, then those guardrails, we can call it regulatory, whatever, are important, but they shouldn't, we shouldn't hit them. And that, that's the, what we want to make sure we're doing as an organization is trying to stay ahead with our clients' feedback of where they're going and what they want, and then just do the right thing. You don't feel like, do, do you think that Washington understands what needs to change for you to be, the, uh, be able to operate in the world today? Or do you see them as an immovable force and you'll work around them? Well, they're certainly a force to be reckoned with. We have to abide by the rules, laws, regulations, capital, liquidity, stress tests, et cetera, et cetera. But it shouldn't stop us from being innovative. Mm -hmm. And we just have to work within those guardrails. Yeah, and I think the, the key is to, is to go about it collaboratively. And, and then you know there's got to be an open dialogue, and I feel like there is, where we can everyone can present their point of view and understand the implications and the unintended consequences of anything with a population as big as, as we all interface with. That's great. Um, John, on a more personal note, I know you've been writing a lot on LinkedIn. And um, uh, I'm curious about you. This is something that a bank CEO would typically not do in the past, you know, expose yourself. What's been the experience like for you? Is it hard? Is it easy? Do you just have someone else do it and you never even look at it? What's, what's the entire process? <laughs> no, well, it turns out I'm a human being. <laughs> uh, and I have feelings and points of view. And, uh, you know, I was asked the question, what's surprised you and delighted you the most about this influencing role? And it's that me being me is more popular than me being the head of Maryland 12th Management. Uh -huh. and, that's what I'm trying to do, is that my values, I live every day in what I do, um, but I, you put them in the context of a structure and a role, people might, you know, there's, they may not trust that. Uh, and I'm very involved in it. And um, do I write every word? No. Um, my son, who's an English major, says, you didn't write that. <laughs> I'm a CPA. Uh, but I actually do spend a lot of time with our team, and I, absolutely, I, talk, I tell them what it is, the way I think, and the points I want to yeah. make, and then I edit it, and we work through it iteratively. But I'm very involved with it because it's my, it's my message. It's right. my point of view. And do you, Gerald, are you doing anything right now? What's yeah. your, do you feel, how comfortable are you with this idea of being a social persona, of being not just a brand, of representing a brand, but of representing you? Well, it's, it's a powerful medium to get a message out to mm -hmm. thousands and tens of thousands of people. And so I started with our own internal you know, social network, and we call it MySource Social, and everyone has their own brand to it. What's been very enlightening to me, surprising and gratifying is the number of responses I get to when I post something. And you know, it'll be a short idea, or in some cases a long idea, or a certain message coming out of a key meeting or an earnings or whatever else. So it's becoming the preferred choice of messaging where instead of sending an email that you know, gets lost in emails, people read this a lot more intensely. And I've been very surprised with the responses I get back. And then I'll, I'll hit you know, respond to the whole group or some of the individuals. And then I'll get a message right back again. I mean, it's very instantaneous and, and, and very gratifying. I've learned a lot through the process. And then, you know, I posted a couple blogs on LinkedIn, which has been very interesting. And then our own people who have seen it, and I've gotten some third-party responses to it. Those tend to be a little bit longer, a little more, you know, thought leadership type pieces. Right. And, but it's been very gratifying. And the instantaneous feedback that you get is fantastic. Right. And I want to open it up to questions. I'm going to ask you guys one more on this path. But if you have questions, are there mics that are going around or they're standing? There are mics. Okay. So just raise your hand. We'll get the mic to you. Um, are you encouraging your own employees to do this? Are you, do you want your senior executives doing it? How much do you want them being out there versus them being out there versus just repeating what the brand messages are really backing up the, ba the brand's message? No, I, we're encouraging all of our senior executives, particularly on our internal Mysore social one, to get involved, to respond post their own thoughts, get reaction. Because again, we're getting a lot of instantaneous feedback about how our employees are feeling and how, what they're thinking about, how they're collaborating on projects. Um, they tell us that we're dumb in certain cases, which, you know, hey, you know, the, the rank and file know more about what's going on in the organization sometimes than I do. 
and, and having other senior executives that engaged will make us a better and stronger company. So we're absolutely encouraging it of all of our senior executives. Great. In our case, it has a very practical um, application as our advisors who really are the expression of our value. I mean, we absolutely want them out. We, I don't want 15,000 versions of the message um, because that doesn't help you know, what it is we're trying to do. But our message is pretty simple and, and easy to understand around making sure that our clients' financial lives, we can help them make them better. And that's really the theme we want. But yeah, I want, I want our people participating. Great. I think that's a very different feeling than you probably would have had two years ago, right? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, a few years ago, we were afraid of it. Mm -hmm. We weren't quite sure what responses we would get. Um, we had yeah. input from those from the guardrails. Right. From the guardrails, uh, from the security point of view, um, lots of different hurdles to get through. And we ultimately decided that um, if we don't do this, we're not going to be a better company. I remember hearing two years, two years ago now, a bank CEO saying, we've got a really great system. We can now get a tweet from being written to being out on Twitter in four hours yeah. and bragging about <laughs> That's changed. All right. That's so, changed. Um, yeah. <laughs> questions. Uh, got questions right here. If you could identify yourself, that'd be great. Hi, my name, hi, my name is Simon Heaton. I work with Barclays. Um, thank you for making time today. You talked about bringing um, the best and brightest into the industry. LinkedIn's in-demand employers survey last year, I think the first bank to feature in the top 100 was Goldman Sachs at number 47, and then there wasn't any other banks. Do you think as an industry we can come together to bring people to the industry rather than trying to do it each and each, each bank doing it separately? Well, that's an interesting question. You know, a lot of us get together in, in small groups, big groups, trying to improve how the public perceives the financial services industry. Um, we've slightly, slightly, slightly moved the needle in the perception of financial institutions, but not enough. And I actually think, you know, LinkedIn, social networking, other means of getting our messages out will, will help and continues to help. So behind the scenes, I think we can collaborate as organizations on key messages to the marketplace and to the, uh, the world's constituency that we actually create jobs, we help economic growth, we do things on social finance, that we do things that help investors save money for retirement, for healthcare, for school, for education, for lots of good things in the marketplace. And we've just got to keep pushing that message both as an industry as an individual firms. I think the other thing I'd add is we've got to go to more, uh, more places. I mean, Goldman Sachs wouldn't have come to my school to interview me. And so we got to make sure we, um, we are everywhere as an industry talking to all different kinds of students and not just spending our time up in this area of the world because there's talent everywhere. everywhere. That's great. <clears throat> more questions. Just raise your hand. Got it. That was it. Re recruiting. Um, well, guys, this has been terrific. Thank you so much for coming here. Very uh, enlightening conversation. Really appreciate it. Well, thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Thanks for having us, Dan. Right.